One was frozen, one was stuffed, another turned to soap. Not all corpses find their final resting place. Some famous corpses are still out in the public eye with memorable stories to tell. If all you know about Eva Perón, the former first lady of Argentina, is what you learned from the musical Evita, you're aware she died tragically young of cancer. However, what happened to her after might surprise you. For some reason, no one thought to make a sequel where Ava's widow, Juan Perón, and his third wife, Isabel, dance around her body and sing about how they'll make her pretty again. <laughs> Believe it or not, that's actually what happened, minus the singing and dancing. With Ava dead, her husband's popularity nosedived, and her perfect body was still unburied. Juan was removed from the presidency in a coup. The new regime then stole Ava's body, and it began a strange journey that included time in government buildings, a van, and a purposely mislabeled grave in Italy. Eventually, Ava's body was deterred and returned to Perón, who was then living in Spain. Reunited with his wife's body after 16 years, he kept it in his home. Carlos Bodona, a confidant to Perón, was there when the body was delivered. He recalled that General Perón, the gardener, and I took the body out of the coffin. We lay it on a marble-topped table. Our hands got dirty from all the earth, so the body had to be cleaned. Isabel took care of that very carefully with a cotton cloth and water. She combed the hair and cleaned it bit by bit, and then blow-dried it. It took several days. Dictators have many things in common, but one of the strangest commonalities is the desire for their bodies to be displayed long after the strongmen are dead. Mao Zedong, for example, is on display in Tiananmen Square to this day. Perhaps his people got the idea from the Soviets, who embalmed Vladimir Lenin and put him on display decades earlier. You know, there are an estimated 14,000 statues of this man in the Soviet Union. That means that wherever you went in the USSR, there was probably at least one Lenin. On the website of McAllister College, Lenin's biographer Robert Service writes about this bizarre decision, saying, Lenin was not merely to be depicted as a heroic figure in the history of Bolshevism. He had to enjoy the mythic status of an omniscient revolutionary saint. Vladimir Lenin ended up the closest thing communism had to a god. But the thing that makes saints' bodies special is their incorruptibility. So to make it look like Lenin's body didn't rot, a lot of work was going to have to go into preserving it. Experts are brought in to freshen him up occasionally. Alexei Yorchuk, a professor of social anthropology at UC Berkeley, explained to Scientific American that they have to substitute occasional parts of skin and flesh with plastics and other materials. So in terms of the original biological matter, a body is less and less of what it used to be. Saint Bernadette of Lourdes started out as a young peasant girl in France, but her life changed forever in 1858 when she told people about her visions of the Virgin Mary. Little Bernadette was suddenly world famous, but she hated the attention. After hiding out in a nunnery, she decided to become one herself. Sadly, Sister Bernadette would die of tuberculosis in 1879 at the age of 35. However, miracles associated with Bernadette continued after her death, which meant she was eligible to be canonized. The long process of becoming a saint involves some slightly odd requirements, including exhuming her body three different times between 1909 and 1925. Fortunately for those who had to do this deed, Bernadette, who had been very pretty in life, was somehow still unexpectedly pretty decades after her death. A doctor who was present the second time her body was dug up in 1919 wrote, the body is practically mummified, covered with patches of mildew and quite a noticeable layer of salts, which appear to be calcium salts. The skin has disappeared in some places, but it is still present on most parts of the body. This was good enough for the church, who decided Bernadette's body incorrupt, made her a saint, and put her on display for pilgrims to visit. The Mütter Museum of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia is famous for its strange collection of objects, many of which are not for those with a weak stomach. But perhaps none is as deeply affecting as the corpse of a woman known as the Soap Lady. A former curator of the museum described the corpse as one of the most revolting objects that can be imagined. But he and the other curators know the public like looking at weird things, which is why they've kept her on display almost continually for a century and a half. She's not in a refrigerated case. She is basically, for lack of a better term, shelf stable. You can still see her today in a glass case, with her face twisted into what appears to be a terrified scream. Her eyes are sunken and her toes are pointed. Her most noticeable feature, however, and what earned her the Soap Lady nickname, is the coating all over her body. Called saponification, it occurs when the fat in a body goes through a very rare process and becomes a dark wax on the outside of the skin. General Conlog, a professor at Quinnipiac University, told Wired, what we may be looking at is a shell or casing made of this soapy substance sealing out the outside environment. There is no water in the soap lady's body at all. While the corpse was originally labeled the woman named Ellen Bogan, other details like her age and when she died have been proven wrong over the years. So sadly, she is still unidentified after all this time. 
According to History Daily, the tomb of Li Chang, the Marquis of Dai, was discovered by accident during the construction of an air raid shelter in China in 1971. It was an astonishingly important and extensive archaeological wonder. And then the team found the body of Xin Zhui, also known as Lady Dai, she was the Marquis's wife. Although she died well over 2,000 years before, her body was in remarkable shape, with one scientist telling China Daily, the body is so well preserved that it can be autopsied by pathologists as if it were only recently dead. When Lady Di was found, her skin was supple and her limbs could be manipulated. Her hair was intact. Her type A blood still ran red in her veins, and her internal organs were all intact. What really sets her apart from other mummified bodies, uh, first of all, is the, the flexibility of her limbs. While that all sounds amazing, the thing most viewers would care about, like her face, was swollen to an unnatural size and shape. It's not clear exactly how her body was in such a good state of preservation after more than two millennia, but scientists have theories. The corpse might have been covered in acid or mercury, which would have killed the bacteria that would normally deal with a dead body. And she was further protected thanks to layers of silk and a matrioska doll-like system of nesting coffins. Many times, people whose bodies are displayed after death didn't initially request the strange honor. For example, Mao Zedong specifically asked to be cremated, but his wishes were ignored. However, Jeremy Bentham knew his wishes and he was going to get them, even if he wasn't an all-powerful dictator. Bentham had always been an eccentric guy, especially for his time. The Times Literary Supplement describes a philosopher who died in 1832 at the age of 84 as a Republican, radical, feminist, and gay rights advocate. However, his wishes for his corpse, outlined in his will shortly before he died, took his quirkiness to a new level. Bentham instructed that, My skeleton will be put together in such a manner as that the whole figure may be seated in a chair usually occupied by me when living, in the attitude in which I am sitting when engaged in thought in the course of time employed in writing. The skeleton is to be clad in one of the suits of black occasionally worn by me." He then gave specific instructions for this auto icon's display. It all came to be and eventually ended up at University College London, where it was moved to an even more conspicuous location in 2020, a glass case in the student center. The university explained in a statement, Bentham's new home provides greatly enhanced preservation conditions, better visitor access, and a place at the center of the student community. Oliver Cromwell was a member of Parliament in the middle of the 1600s and was instrumental in ending the monarchy, albeit temporarily, with the execution of Charles I. Cromwell would go on to become Lord Protector and managed not to be executed himself, instead dying of a variety of illnesses aged 59 in 1658. He was given a prime burial spot in Westminster Abbey alongside a king, and while his actual burial was incredibly simple in keeping with his Puritan belief, a large public funeral service without his body was also held. When Charles II, son of Charles I, was returned to the throne in 1660, he wasn't thrilled with the guy who effectively killed his dad, as you might expect. So the king threw Cromwell out of the abbey and had his corpse hanged and beheaded just for good measure. Then his head went on a pike for all to see. Eventually, heads displayed that way will fall off. And this is where the story of Cromwell's corpse gets really weird. According to Sky History, the story goes that a guard took the head when the wind finally knocked it down. The trail goes cold for a while until the head turned up again in the early 1700s and was passed around between collectors. One of them even liked to take out Cromwell's head and show it to guests. Eventually, the head believed to be Cromwell's was buried in a semi-secret spot at Cambridge University. The romance of Percy and Mary Shelley was one for the ages, according to the Rosenbach Museum and Library. That's Shelley. Beautiful, isn't he? They endured a huge amount of personal problems, hung out with cool celebs like Lord Byron, and wrote some great poems and novels while they were at it. And they did it all before they turned 30. In fact, Percy Shelley did literally everything before he turned 30, since he died in a boating accident at 29. His widow, Mary, was only 24. In keeping with the gothic tone of the woman who came up with Frankenstein, after Mary died, a rather creepy discovery was made. It was discovered she kept her husband's heart in her desk for decades. Unusual for the time, Percy was cremated, but after the funeral pyre on the beach was extinguished, his mostly undamaged heart was discovered in the ashes. Fellow novelist, adventurer, and buddy of famous literary figures Edward John Trelawney was there and said he pulled it out himself. His theory for why the heart didn't burn was that, in all cases of death from suffocation, the heart is gorged with blood. Consequently, it is the more difficult to consume, especially in the open air. But there's a possibility Mary may have mistakenly held on to something far less romantic, Percy's liver. According to 19th century reporting, the heart, being hollow, is easily destroyed, while the liver, which is the most solid mass of the internal organs, resists most intense heat. 
Shelley's liver was saturated with seawater and was on that account more than normally incombustible. Baseball player Ted Williams was interested in being frozen and reanimated after death through cryonics, or rather, he might have been. The drama surrounding his death and whether he actually wanted to be cryonically preserved led to a court case that tore his family apart. Eventually, Williams' corpse was preserved at the Alcor facility in Arizona. Our goal is to have reversible suspended animation, just like in the movies. But years later, Williams was back in the news when former employees of Alcor blew the whistle on some less than acceptable things they allege went on at the company, including how Williams' corpse was treated. For example, his head was separated from his body, which was standard, but then things got weird. Cindy Felix, a former facilities operation manager at Alcor, told Deadspin, they want the heads resting on something, not just sitting at the bottom of the stock pot. The chosen headrest? A tuna can. And when it was discovered Williams' head was stuck to the can? Well, according to Larry Johnson in his book Frozen, My Journey into the World of Cryonics, Deception, and Death, he watched as another employee grabbed a monkey wrench, heaved a mighty swing, missing the tuna can completely, but hitting the head dead center. Tiny pieces of frozen head sprayed around the room. The company, perhaps not surprisingly, released a statement saying, Alcor denies allegations reported in the press that there was mistreatment of the remains of Ted Williams at Alcor. 